So a very, very brief introduction that I want you to run, uh, I want to run through just now. The Center for Science and Society was founded in 2014 to support cross-disciplinary conversations between faculty, students, research scholars. Um, and we have one particular cluster, and probably and arguably the most exciting cluster in the Center for Science and Society, which is the Global History of Science cluster. And uh, I have two colleagues, uh, Professor Marwa El Shakri and Professor Eugenia Lean, uh, who are my co-conspirators uh, co in this uh, cluster. And we work together, and I'm Kavita Sivramakrishnan. I'm co-lead uh, in this uh, Global History of Science cluster. I work on global health history, as well as the environmental and health histories of South Asia. Um, this seminar was really conceived as a seminar on comparative histories of health, medicine, in the global south. Our aim was really to have, um, have our graduate students lead the seminar, to invite speakers, to host book events. And from the beginning to the end, the people who are the energy and the initiative and all the intellect uh, and uh, who represent all the intellectual ferment in this uh, seminar are our graduate students. So I'll pause very, very quickly and hand over to someone who's been absolutely the driving force for this seminar. And that's uh, Upanita Mukherjee. Uh, Upanita, do you want to do the introductions and uh, kick off the seminar? Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much, Kavita. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is usually held as a very small, intimate seminar, but uh, the move to Zoom has allowed us to open our doors uh, to have everyone participate, and we are thrilled to have a full Zoom room. Um, and uh, a big welcome to Professor Bhaipan Panerjee and Professor Durba Mitro. Um, I'll very briefly introduce um, our invited speakers today. Uh, professor Doipan Banerjee is an assistant professor of science, technology, and society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, he studies science and technology in the global south with a focus on India. And in his research, he pays attention to the ways in which social inequities shape medical, scientific, and technological practices. Uh, he co-authored the monograph Hematologies, the Political Life of Blood in India with Jacob Kochman, and is currently working on computing technologies in India. Uh, but today, we are going to hear him talk about his new book, Enduring Cancer, Life, Death, and Diagnosis in Delhi. So welcome, Professor Banerjee. And I just realized, uh, you know, for our seminar, you are the anthropologist among historians. So welcome. Uh, and also a big welcome to Professor Durva Mitro. Uh, Durva Mitro is Assistant Professor of uh, Women, Gender and Sexuality and uh, Carol K. Uh, Forsheimer Assistant Professor at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University. Uh, she's a historian of modern South Asia. Her research and teaching explores histories of sexuality, science, epistemology, gender, queer studies and feminist thought. Her book, uh, Indian Sex Life, Sexuality and the Colonial Origins of Modern Social Thought came out earlier this year. Uh, and there she talks about how uh, modern social theory emerged out of ideas of deviant female sexuality in colonial India. Her current research explores the history of third world feminist theory and South-South solidarity movements. And this evening, uh, Professor Mitro will act as chief discussant um, on Professor Banerjee's book. So without further ado, I am going to very quickly uh, mention things that we by now uh, all know. Um, the you know usual logistical sort of uh, points. Uh, we'll have Professor Banerjee talk first about the book, then have Professor Mitro respond very briefly. And then just to sort of keep the conversational mood of our goal, um, we are going to, um, uh, so Professor Mitro and I are going to take turns posing a set of questions to Professor Banerjee and, uh, and he's going to respond. Uh, and following that, we'll open the floor up for questions from you know, all the participants and, you know, the usual, we're all Zoom veterans now, I suppose. So just, you know, use the, the sort of virtual raise hand button on, on Zoom and just wait for us to call on you to ask questions. It'll be great if you can keep the questions brief. So Professor Banerjee has time to respond. Um, so Professor Banerjee, over to you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you, uh, Punita, Kavita, and Ruba for uh, putting this together in the middle of the pandemic. I, it, I don't know, a book falls in a forest metaphor is coming to mind. And uh, it's really good to be able to share this work with you. Uh, Durba has already warned me that she's going to be a very strict timekeeper. So I'm going to jump right into the presentation. Uh, I just want to begin with showing a brief one minute clip from a movie I really like from the 1970s.
So I have no idea what that device actually is, but the affect it evokes, uh, silence and pressure, uh, really gets to the concerns of my book. Uh, the great unsaid in that is obviously that a diagnosis is cancer. So in a sense, this book is all about the weight and pressure of a cancer diagnosis and how it impresses itself upon already fragile social worlds. Um, while the idea of cancer as a form of social pressure might seem obvious, I don't know if it really is. In fact, what I find in almost all popular accounts of cancer is the opposite, which is the dramatic diagnosis of cancer as marking a sort of radical rupture from everyday life. So as most stories go, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, uh, cancer turns life upside down and one emerges from it either reborn or broken. So in other words, cancer ruptures and it does so in one of two ways. It either leaves patients and families devastated or it offers them not only the uh, uh, ability to survive, but to emerge from it renewed, a better and more self-aware person. So while many of us might be familiar with this idea of cancer packaged in a neat big ribbon in the United States, these stories of renewal and rebirth are not only American or European. In fact, in one chapter, I trace a very similar pattern of cruel optimism in affordable paperback Indian and English uh, memoirs sold on the streets of Delhi. So to put the emphasis on the continuities between pre and post diagnosis, uh, but pre and post diagnosed selves and not its ruptures is in my mind to slightly shift these globally circulating narratives uh, to contradict their uh, idea that cancer marks a radical break from everyday life and the life that comes after. So my interest in these continuities emerged from fieldwork and at the time I wondered why it was important for me to focus on these sorts of continuities between the past and uh, present in the future of cancer. Uh, I was a little uncomfortable with its uh, possible implication that cancer was not truly a devastating event. Uh, but gradually I came to understand that to track these continuities was really the only way to show how the disease sedimented into the give and take of everyday life. For example, it helped me to explain how the disease nestled into or tore apart already fragile kinship ties, why my interlocutors often uh, refused to name the disease, and why some could access treatments while others could not. I might even go as far as to say that this is a book less about cancer and more about what cancer revealed about the fragile worlds in which my interlocutors lived. So in a nutshell, this is the main argument of my book, that to understand what cancer means is to understand how it puts pressure on already frayed social relations, revealing their brittleness and also testing their capacity for further support. Its pressures reveals cracks and fault lines, long-standing failures in Indian medical care, prior betrayals in marriage and personal histories that make some more vulnerable to the, to the disease than others. So for example, this ethnography unfolds in Delhi, where for most of the urban poor, a cancer diagnosis comes too late for curative intervention. That is, long wait times in public health facilities ensure that the disease uh, would have most of, more often than not progressed beyond the time of cancer's traditional treatment modalities, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and so on. So let me say a little bit about the scholarly and public interventions I have hoped to make through this book. There is an emerging and necessary critique in my discipline, medical anthropology, that it has become too preoccupied with suffering. This is a criticism I want to be sensitive to. I don't want to join in a thriving industry inside and outside academia that is preoccupied with poverty in the third world and the empathy this poverty demands. If this book is anything, it is not that. It is not a call for more empathy for the urban poor in the global south. Rather, it is an examination of the specificities and particular histories of regions and biographies that I believe we must reckon with if we are to reckon with the disease's global emergence. So what are these particular regional histories and conditions? So in discussions about the rise of cancer in India, journalists and scholars often conflate the uncontrolled rapid growth of cancer cells with the recent growth of the Indian economy. 
Articles in scientific journals such as Nature and The Lancet have claimed that cancer is a disease of growth linked to increased affluence. At the same time, reports from the WHO find that, the cancer, that that cancer is no longer a Western disease, quote unquote, but has for the first time entered the developing world. Within India, two journalistic accounts uh, echo this global alarm about a cancer epidemic, a new cancer epidemic. Again, I'm suspicious of these narratives of rupture. Is it really true that there is a sudden growth and explosion of the disease in places like India? My answer is probably not. The same statistics can be always made to tell different stories. When adjusted for India's large population, the high numbers of cancer cases do not really seem as alarming. There is also no consensus on whether the rise in numbers is in or out of step with demographic changes and population growth. And if COVID-19 is relevant to my discussion today at all, it is to give the lie to this public health myth make, that makes neat divisions between infectious diseases as a problem of the global south and chronic diseases as a problem of the global north. In the US, public health theory took for granted that we had transcended the age of pandemics. And I'm quoting uh, the author of uh, the idea of a global epidemiological transition, who used that precise phrase to make his point that the West had moved on to diseases like cancer, while the non-West still lagged behind fighting infectious diseases. Of course, now with COVID-19, this meat division has come under pressure, if not completely collapsed. But we shouldn't have needed a pandemic to bust this myth. Medical practitioners on the ground have been fighting this false division between the diseases of the rich and poor from at least the 19th century. Here, the case of cancer in India is instructive. For example, as early as 1888, the resident British surgeon major in Jaipur contested claims in the British medical journals that cancer was a disease of the meat-eating breast and therefore did not trouble mostly vegetarian Indians. He countered this claim, uh, he, he countered with his claim that he had personally conducted 102 cancer operations and to say that cancer was a disease of civilization was dangerously obscuring the re realities he, sh he saw. So cut to 1904 when colonial surgeons presented further evidence of the widespread prevalence of cancer in the British colonies leading the Prince of Wales to declare that cancer was not a scourge of civilization, quote, as he had previously thought. Cut again to 1935, when two Indian doctors at KEM College in Lahore dem demonstrated that the statistical incidence of cancer in, in India was about the same as anywhere else in the world. But despite this undercurrent of resistance, Popular accounts, as well as mainstream public health dogma, clings obstinately to the belief that the urgency of infectious diseases outweighed the problem of diseases such as cancer in the global south. Now, my concern with all of this is not as a historian, as Upanita said, I'm an anthropologist. Kavita's work is, of course, the best account of the global politics of aging and demography and cancer in 20th century India. I bring this history up only because of its contemporary implications in my work where this myth is packaged in a new form. If cancer is a disease of the West, now the story goes, then its rising in incidence must have something to do with the region's economic liberalization since the 1990s. Now take, for example, a leading public health account of cancer in the developing world that proposes that, uh, that the cancer problem in India is because a new middle class and I quote, has embraced a Western lifestyle characterized by Western habits such as high fat, high fat diets, reduced physical activity, increased alcohol consumption, and tobacco smoking. Now, my problem with this made up narrative is its two dangerous outcomes. First, framing cancer as a disease of a prosperous elite legitimizes the absence of cancer care for India's rural and urban poor when in fact the disease does not respect regional or class lines. In my ethnography in Delhi, I found that the disease had no such respect uh, and it affected the rich and poor alike. Other researchers have documented its rural prevalence. Add to this the documented fact that cancer is unrivaled in India as a disease that makes poor, draining higher income groups of their financial well-being. Now, the second problem I have with this made up narrative is that 
it shifts blame onto patients rather than health systems. So for example, the current Na National Institute for Cancer Prevention and Research guidelines in India emphasizes how new lifestyle choices such as alcohol consumption, overwork, meat eating, meat eating, and even sexual promiscuity are primary risk factors for cancer in India. In response, this apex governmental body promotes abstinence from such self-harm as a countermeasure to the disease. For another very quick example, the most comprehensive government report on cancer care in post-colonial India begins with a message from the Prime Minister and the Health Minister urging behavioral correction as an answer to this new lifestyle epidemic brought about, I quote, the plagues of modernity. This trope uh, and this report, sorry, rehearses to the letter colonial tropes that cancer is a concern, uh, consequence of Western practices of drinking alcohol and eating meat. This is the broader frame for the more specific inter interventions uh, in my book. By focusing on the effects of the disease on the urban poor in, De in Delhi, I find that the pervasiveness of cancer has little to do with lifestyle and everything to do with the healthcare system that has failed to provide adequate treatment and care. This rather than fall patients for their inability to absorb socioeconomic change, I, I find that the whole point of my book is to describe the inventive strategies of patients and families that seek treatment and to uh, and seek to maintain networks of social support so that they might survive in circumstances hostile to their uh, survival. Um, so I leave the framing there and get into the more specific interventions, I hope, in the question answers with Durba and Upanita. Thank you so much, Swai. Um, I'm just going to offer just a few minutes of comments um, and then hopefully we can get into more conversational mode. In Dwight Banerjee's Enduring Cancer, Life, Death, and Diagnosis in Delhi, we learn of what it means to study and write that which is unspeakable, in this case, a cancer diagnosis. In his careful ethnographic study of care work, of palliative treatment, of social worlds surrounding cancer diagnosis in Delhi, Banerjee tells us of concealment and reticence, of doubt and stubborn unwillingness, of the structural violence of social life that manifests in the form of enduring, whether it is enduring domestic violence made acute by cancer diagnosis, enduring the pain of cancer without sufficient palliative treatment, enduring the fact that death from cancer is often a period of extended suffering and bodily failure, rather than the ethical and honorable end we see in narratives of triumphant loss that we hear in movies and films. It is about a world that gives you the ideology of honor and empathy to make cancer somehow palatable, and then systematically denies you the right to live. In his conceptual work with the idea of endurance, we learn of these impossible conditions of post-colonial life and its proximity to pain in the form of poverty and disease. Diseases that are scientifically supposedly treatable, but not so for most of the people in the world. Etymologically, endurance, enduring, to endure is to harden oneself, to undergo suffering so much so that it changes the composition of one's actual matter, one's physical form. People change, they harden to the realities of poverty and the impossible challenges of pollution, of endless work, of failed infrastructures in urban life. To leave something unspoken then is to survive and endure, according to Banerjee, but also to leave unnamed the systemic failures that see proximity to death as an inevitable fact of life for most of the poor people in the world. And so we live in the subjunctive mood as Banerjee describes it. I can think of no more important a question for our moment now than a reticence to mourn, the unspoken and largely unaccounted grief and psychic trauma that is unaccounted for deaths in the face of systemic failure in our present. As Pakistani writer Mohammed Hanif describes in the New York Times in this past July, he says, quote, I've made a few condolence calls during the past few months. None of the people I called to condole had died of COVID-19. I was always given another reason. He tells of the many heart attacks, the strokes, really every other reason people die in South Asia that are not the coronavirus or cancer. Nothing is more resonant than the fact that some deaths in our world are unspeakable, while some are also to be expected. Some people, some communities, poor people in South Asia, older people, migrants, should simply affect the uh, sorry, accept the fact of their suffering and death and must live in silence and reticence. 
Energy's book then offers us the tools to think through our res reticence and the reticence of those diagnosed with cancer. The absolute unwillingness to recognize a diagnosis of systemic failure, our unwillingness to face the perpetual mourning of pandemic. We academics see this reticence in this moment now, the unspoken toll, unspoken toll of lives lost so massively that people try again and again to quantify those losses through analogy. Lives lost equivalent to, through, to the numbers of World War II, more lives than XYZ event. What is it about pandemics, whether chronic or infectious disease that produces such reticence to confront pandemics, cancer or otherwise, even as we call again and again for the analogy that somehow could make us hear about these deaths? Cancer certainly elicits the system of shame and silence that governs this reticence. Banerjee asks, what is it about the body attacking itself under impossible conditions of labor, of pollution, of environmental degradation that makes cancer unspeakable? And how are we to unwrite racist narratives of development, of indulgence and modernization, as Banerjee just spoke about, of the ability of the Indian body to somehow withstand pain no matter what, to make people attend to suffering for most of the people in the world? Enduring cancer poses these difficult questions. What is the claim to ethics, one that goes beyond facing or imagining or empathizing with individual suffering? What appeals to witness will make visible these everyday experiences of structural failure? These are but a few of the theoretical insights from his study for thinking endurance, concealment, and the diseases left unspoken, the fragility of social relationships, because to speak them would mean to confront the failure of systems that are built to claim healing and diagnosis while perpetually neglecting those that they claim to heal. As Banerjee argues, a cancer diagnosis is not a transformative event. It is not a crisis. People always live fragile lives and cancer makes acute what was already clearly indelicate balance. Endurance is a hardening, but it is also surviving in a system that does not nothing to sustain the survival of those who face fragility every day. It is in the words of, of the R. Anuradha poem that closes Banerjee's study to be obstinate. In Banerjee, we learn of a politics of endurance invention and how on occasion there is an opening in the face of pervasive suffering that renders a different kind of politics, of confrontation, of recognizing and critiquing systemic failures. As I reflect on enduring cancer now, I wonder how we might see or think about a politics of cancer or a politics of pandemic when there is so much reticence that surrounds this disease. We see other moments, openings for social movements right now for confrontation in, in India from enduring never ending systems of oppression, whether it's demonetization of territorial military expansion, the denial of citizenship, the lynching of Muslims, caste atrocities, and right now in this moment, we are seeing the massive dispossession of farmers who face extraordinary state violence as they again descend on that city, Delhi. But there are no social movements, no massive demonstrations for those everyday people who are afflicted with cancer, with pandemic suffering. And I wonder if we might find a different kind of politics here, one that requires a sustained act of bearing witness, of invention, of survival, of persistence and refusal in the face of neglect. In Banerjee, I find a trenchant critique of the ethnographic call for individual empathy, a call that may make us feel like we are humanists, but does little to transform the structural inequalities that lead to the reticence to name the disease inside of you. And with that, we're going to start our Q&A. But first, I want to have take an opportunity to introduce Ubunita Mukherjee, who organized this event. Upernita Mukherjee works on braided histories of criminal detection. She is now a PhD candidate at Columbia University's Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies Department and is writing a fantastic dissertation on criminal detection and legal epistemologies in British India. Upernita, why don't you open it up? Thank you so much for that very, very generous introduction, Professor Mitro. Um, I'll lead with the first question. Um, so I wanted to ask you to develop the idea of endurance that frames the book, um, and particularly the interplay between your focus on the contingent pra practices of enduring cancer, um, that comes through in the first chapters of the book really strongly, and the idea of an ethics of endurance that you develop 
towards you know the end of the book, uh, especially in the conclusion. Um, so the the word enduring in the title you know provides your readers an early clue that your research moves beyond the sort of catastrophe narratives that typically frame our understanding of how cancer changes people's lived realities. Um, instead, you urge us to be attentive to how your interlocutors. Uh, you know, find ways of living with and alongside, indeed, of enduring cancer. Um, you describe these strategies variously as experiments, uh, as as managing social relations, as coping, as uh, as you know, um, as efforts in in innovations. Um, and as we read the book, we realize that for your interlocutors, uh, there is no right or wrong way to know how to live with cancer, um, whether to reveal diagnosis, whether to conceal it. Uh, whether to focus on cure versus whether to direct energy towards alleviating pain. Um, and one of the powerful arguments you make in your book is that you know, your interlocutors, especially the patients and their caregivers, have to figure out a way to live with, with the disease that works for them. Um, in other words, the early chapters put in sharp relief the deeply contingent and improvisational nature of these negotiations of enduring cancer. And in the conclusion, you begin to develop an idea of the ethics of endurance. Um, and for me, it felt like a very interesting and sharp shift in analytical register uh, from the contingent uh, and, and the improvised to the language of norms. Um, I wanted to ask you what made you pursue this shift of analytical focus? Uh, and why did you think it was important to think endurance across the registers of the pragmatic and the normative? And I ask this especially because you know, as Professor Mitro already has pointed out, reading your book now with, with a pandemic raging through the world, I think we're all beginning to realize the complex ways in which, you know, the devastating ruptures and the enduring continuities that we live in the midst of are kind of folded into the pandemic uh, in curious ways. Um, and the imperative to figure out how to live through or to endure the pandemic is pressing down upon all of us. Uh, and your book made me think about whether or not rather how and to what extent this might be an ethical imperative. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my question for you. I mean, uh, thank you for that question, Upanela, because it's, a, it's such an excellent question because it gets to something I'm still trying to work out after writing the book. Uh, I don't know if I myself had seen this kind of slip that you described between the normative and the pragmatic in thinking about endurances and ethics. Um, but let me, to, to get to that, however, let me try and concretize what I mean by endurance by describing one of the ways it showed up in my fieldwork. So my research spanned two field sites, the Cancer Hospital at the All India Institute for, uh, of the Medical Sciences, or AIMS as it is better known. Uh, it's India's largest and best funded government hospital, and, uh, and that was one of my field sites. The second was Delhi's foremost cancer care NGO, CanCERPORT, with whom I visited the homes of more than 100 patients. What struck me immediately in the first days of my field work was how rarely the word cancer was spoken aloud. And let me give you an example. I traveled with CanCERPORT to a patient who lived uh, in the outskirts of the city. And uh, unusually, a car had just broken down on the way, and we traveled the last miles in the official NGO van with actually had its logo caring for cancer printed on the door. And the patient uh, who we were visiting, Amarjit, seemed visibly discomfited by the logo. Uh, he absolutely did not have cancer, he said. Uh, and uh, he, if anything, uh, he uh, had something else. So in his refusal to name his diagnosis, uh, I found him exemplary of many others who can support, uh, can support works with, who resisted enclosing the disease within, already, within an already fixed script. So the nurse who had accompanied expertly played along, hoping to transact care on his terms rather than on her own. So she asked, Aapke khyal mein aapko kya hua hai? what do you think has happened to you? Uh, and interestingly, the Hindi word khyal translates both as thought as well as care. Um, Amarjit's careful reply was that he had oncology and I found that to be really interesting. It was a dexterous negotiation of the word cancer and all that the diagnosis entailed. And it was why cancer port almost always entered neighborhoods as discreetly as possible in a bid to respect the strategies of those under their care. Now this tricky relationship between language and cancer continuously haunted my fieldwork, never quite resolving itself. 
So looking through more than about 600 patients' records at AIMS, I found that over 80% had been recorded as quote unquote, unaware of their diagnosis. Now, what does that mean? And through the course of my research, I came to understand that that was honestly not a really good word to have on the questionnaire in the first place. Patients and families often came to their ward and they did hide their prognoses that they'd received from other doctors on colleges. Sometimes hiding prior diagnoses from new doctors, uh, some patients, it was evidence that they were skeptical about biomedical institutions because they believed that revealing a bleak prognosis uh, to a new physician would hurt their chances of accessing care. At other times, they colluded to conceal their diagnosis from neighbors and kin, and most frequently, family members protected each other from the perceived psychic impact of the word. There were many ways, and so there were many ways in which concealment unfolded. Uh, but one thing I find drew them together, it was rarely ever a question of a patient being quote unquote unaware. In the public health literature, con conce and this kind of concealment is taken as a serious problem, as evidence of non-compliance or a way to evade the di diagnosis. Here, I found that it was anything but that. So let me bring this back to endurance. I understand concealment as part of a broader repertoire of strategies to mitigate fragile social relations put under pressure by cancer. So when cancer support workers entered these fraught worlds, they understood that they would need to work on re-knitting these already frayed relational threads. Often, this meant maintaining fictions of concealment, working alongside rather than against the patients they uh, sought to care for. Over time, patients, families, and palliative care workers would experiment with these relations, experiment with language, testing what could be said without incurring harm. For example, one young cancer patient, for one young cancer patient can support work with, concealment became a way of safeguarding his livelihood. He earned his small income by running errands for his neighbors and believed that revealing his diagnosis was, would isolate him, taking away the money he required for the treatment. So as such, my understanding of the stakes of concealment comes closest to Anneli's from Francois' description of an ethics of recessive action. I quote her phrase, recessive action. Francois thinks of conceal concealment as more than just the absence of knowledge and transparency. In instead, she understands concealment as a release from the demands of the imperatives of action that no knowledge often demands. I share Francois's refusal of the equation of agency uh, with action and of concealment with passivity. Rather, I argue that concealment reveals an ethical way of being, not subscribed to the meaning of ethics as acting upon the world to better oneself. Rather, it reveals the capacity to not act in the face of knowledge and of the potentially destructive consequences of action. So for me then, concealment is a paradigmatic example of the will to endure. It is an attunement and attachment to the present, and it unfolds as strategies of speech in this case, as choreographed acts of giving and seeking care, and of the very difficult work of remaining, remaining within kinship ties. So even though it might not look active in the sense of health activism that we are uh, more familiar with, the ACT UP movement in the US is such a great example, uh, endurance of the kind that I described demands thought, creativity, and responsiveness, and shouldn't be dismissed as just a kind of pass passive acceptance of circumstances. So to, get the heart, so to get to the heart of your question, let me just say that I'm troubled that the promise of concealment uh, is not one of recovery or transcendence, but rather of survival. It is always contingent, improvised, and shifting, and looks very little like organized health activism that we are familiar with. So I'm therefore wary of giving it any normative weight. Instead, my effort here is to hold back a little and to just recognize its appearances and at the very least, rescue it from public health and medical condemnation that sees it as just ignorance and evasion. So endurance and concealment appear then to me as ways of survival, 
uh, that are really not the opposite of action, but inventive and creative strategies to live in conditions hostile to one's well-being. Thank you for that, uh, Dwai. I, you know, one of the things that's so striking when I listen to you talk about that is, you know, um, so much of the ethnography and scholarship that we think about with cancer, but also long-term chronic diseases is about bearing witness. And there's so much call to empathy. So one of the things that's really striking in reading your ethnography is both your call to empathy in some ways, but also your willingness to demonstrate your confusion when someone wouldn't call it cancer and instead call it oncology or your willingness to say, you know, I don't necessarily agree with the care worker's decision to force a woman to stay and care give for a cancer patient. You know, that the kind of ambivalence, it's not simply empathy. We can't only have empathy. We have all of these other forms and ways of relating to one another, which include abuse and kinship and intimacy and all of these other questions that are linked to what it means to think about empathy. Um, and it's, you know, that ethnographic contours that make me ask the second question, which is about South Asia, which, you know, I think this is a question particularly for those of you who have not yet read the book, which is about, um, in your account, you describe importantly the way essentialist ideas of Indian capacity for resilience to withstand pain are called on again and again as a way to obscure and at points even justify public health failures and infrastructural inadequacies for serving people who experience cancer pain. You describe the many narratives that surround cancer that obscure the disease, that obfuscate the crisis of care, of failed access to treatment, of perpetual poverty and deprivation. Instead, enduring cancer means enduring social and structural violence. It means subscribing to narratives of sin and redemption and honor and happiness in the face of impoverished death. Um, I am, of course, struck, and I mentioned this in my comments as well, as how about how deeply resonant these ideas are to me about obscuring diagnosis, the perpetual nature of the unspoken when it comes to cancer um, in South Asian families, of silence, of shame, of that social deployment of notions of honor and preventing someone from suffering from disease by not telling them about it. And I imagine you get that reaction a lot of people talking about their resonance with that experience of not talking about disease. It points to one way we might think about South Asia. What is South Asian about the story that you're telling? Um, I wonder if you might reflect on that question, the specificity of the ethnographic and multidisciplinary story that you're telling about the ways in which we can think about cancer and how it's endured in South Asia and what the case of this ethnography of South Asia in a world of ethnographies that are trying to think about suffering, how this helps us think about comparative scholarship on cancer, about chronic diseases of aging, of suffering in the conditions of post-coloniality, or even cancers in a world of cancer infrastructure. In other words, I wonder if you might speak to the case of India and how this study might reframe how we think about cancer and more broadly, the social life of disease. Yeah, thanks, Urba. That's again, such an insightful question because I'm still struggling with it with uh, much after the book has come out. Uh, like you said, I've been asked about the Indianness of this ethnography many times and those asking aren't wrong. Concealment, kinship, aesthetics are all concerns in many parts of the world. It's not as if uh, there's some sort of free speech uh, about cancer ethic that has uh, taken hold in the US, although there are narratives that's, that try to kind of make that claim. Uh, but what I'm trying to make clear is that uh, this lack of Indianness uh, to an extent is not necessarily a problem and that seeing overlaps and uh, continuities between uh, quote unquote India as a region and elsewhere in the world should actually push us as social scientists and anthropologists uh, to think about difference more critically and our tendency to sometimes uh, render difference uh, so uh, strong that others become in uh, the uh, ways of lives of others become uh, sort of indecipherable to us. Uh, so let me again talk a little bit specifically about how this appears in my work. So given that patients often presented at late stages of the disease, pain was one of the most inevitable consequences of uh, the diagnosis. So tracking cancer in Delhi basically meant tracking cancer pain for the most part. And caregivers uh, 
uh, are not alone in uh, uh, sorry cancer uh, cancer caregivers cancer uh, pain specialists are not in India are not alone in ident identifying this as a problem. Uh, this is the idea of a pain epidemic in India is very much now uh, caught in the imagination of public health discourse. Uh, so, for example, a report commissioned by Lancet and authored by some of the most prominent names in global public health began by suggesting that pain was the, that the center of the pain epidemic uh, was uh, in fact India and uh, to obviously the assumption behind that is that there is such a thing as a global pain epidemic particularly afflicting the global south so likewise this is uh, this got taken up and this has some purchase outside uh, just uh, public health literature journalistic accounts uh, that report on global health uh, such as the New Yorker and the BBC, they all restate a really curious uh, statistic that while India produces most of the world's licit opium, drug laws deny opioid analgesia to all but three or four percent of its patients. Now, for me, these things that make uh, that bring up the specificity of India raises an important question: Is this a, even a book about cancer, or is it about cancer pain, one of its peripheral symptoms? Or to put it another way, is there something missing in an ethnography about cancer that does not focus on what we think of as its core practices, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and so on? So when, uh, when we are talking about cancer pain in India and cancer treatment in the United States, are we even talking about the same thing? So my claim is that we are, and that our inability to see the continuities should not uh, should actually lead us to question some of the most basic assumptions of the disease anywhere in the world. And these basic assumptions are that cancer pain is the disease's side effect. This single gesture both marginalizes cancer pain as something that is not the center at heart of the disease, and it marginalizes the insights of cancer caregivers and workers in places like Delhi. So take, for example, again, Cancer for the NGO that I worked with. Like NGOs in the Global North, it too organized Walks for Life, uh, events that raised awareness about cancer, but however, found that even in such events oriented towards survival, the NGO made sure to emphasize that its primary mandate was adding life to days, not days to life. What do I mean by that? Cancer Port's founder, Harmala Gupta, described this orientation really well in, in, as a realist response to the context of cancer care in India. And I'm quoting her when she says, is there any point in investing our limited resources in more and more expensive and futile treatments when the majority of our cancer population is unlikely to benefit from them at all? And she cites studies by The Lancet and The Economist uh, in her critique of this blinkered search for an elusive cure. And I quote her again as she says, uh, this, this search is a path strewn with broken promises, dashed hopes, crushed lives, and a public health system that is no longer able to cope. So to sum it up, my hope for this book is uh, that it is taken as a case study of cancer, not just, of, uh, not just restricted to the post-colony, but as instructive, uh, instructive and chastening for the metropole. So Gupta's insight about the collateral damage of the war against cancer speaks volumes to how cancer pain is dismissed as a concern often in the United States. Those that care for cancer pain uh, in, in the United States are relegated to the bottom of the biomedical hierarchy, uh, therapists, counselors, nurses, and so on. The imaginary of hope and survival that drives cancer rhetoric in the US, something we're all very familiar with, leaves very little space for uncomfortable questions about death and pain. So in my hope, uh, one of my hopes of this book in a sense is that those involved in public care and cancer care in the United States read this not as a case study of India, but as illustrative of blind spots in thinking about the disease everywhere in the world. And to do this, to take this seriously, would be to reject campaigns that pinkwash the many inequalities that contribute to cancer's etiologies. So in this week, centering pain in an analysis of cancer is my way of demonstrating what uh, Jean and John Komarov Com called theory from the South. Uh, for me, thinking about cancer pain offers an opportunity to clarify the collective stakes of this condition, not only in Delhi, but anywhere in the world, really. I like um, how you say that, right? There's a kind of discomfort of you as you describe yourself in the ethnography, um, and that kind of 
foregrounding discomfort and pain as a way of thinking, I think is a very difficult question and one that you really beautifully describe over the course of the book. Um, we are gonna open up to questions. So if you have a question, please use the hand raise function. I will be a heavy duty moderator, as you can see, I like being a dominant person. And so uh, I uh, first I, I have a question uh, from Dipoyan uh, Gupta. Thank you so much for, for so far, Dwight. Hi, hi Dwight. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, my question, much like you, uh, you know, we've lived back and forth between Delhi and the United States and have observed uh, and been to doctors on both continents and seen how differently uh, doctors and the medical system works. Um, you mentioned how um, there's a lot of sometimes obfuscation, not quite mentioning the disease by name and allowing the, uh, the patient to kind of drive that story. Um, from your observations, I guess this is a two-part question. Um, is it the patient driving that? Is it often the family driving that? As we know in India, often a diagnosis is not just delivered to one individual like it is in the West, but shared with the entire family. So I guess my, my first question is, do you see that? I feel like you are talking about that as a way for the patient to reclaim agency. Um, I just wanted to see if you could talk about that a little bit more and whether that whether there's a pro anacon to that. And then for Western doctors, both doctors trained in the West and coming back to India to treat patients, and also for Western doctors dealing with Indian immigrant communities in the United States, how would you recommend they negotiate between this very important way in which to frame disease and frame pain for the patient, while also balancing out the fact that, especially if you're practicing in the United States, there are certain regulations that are very necessary to follow in terms of HIPAA laws, in terms of using the correct taxonomy when talking to the patient, and sometimes excluding the family from the diagnosis. Thanks, Upan. That's such a great question. And I don't know if I should out you, but the pine also happens to be the son of Hermala Gupta, the person I just talked about. Uh, but not, that's neither here or there. Uh, I'm going to restrict my answer to the first part of that question because uh, the second part uh, is a whole uh, a whole thing in itself. And uh, Ira Malam, uh, 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 a scholar in Harvard, is much better positioned to think about the relationship between Indian doctors and patients in the US. Uh, taking my, in my ethnography, uh, watching in, in the beginning, watching those moments of non-disclosure uh, by doctor, by doctors, and often disclosure to let's say male members of the family rather than the woman uh, would trouble me, and I'm not sure that it stopped troubling me at all. Uh, and the way that that uh, non-disclosure is distributed often tells you everything you need to know about the balance of power in a family uh, and its situation uh, in responding to the disease. At the same time, I would my troubles are a little bit uh, mollified by uh, following these patients uh, with cancer for, for longer periods of time and realizing that no one really is ever unaware of what, it, what they're going through. Uh, and that's where the reclaiming of agency becomes important. So not always saying and owning their cancer does not mean that uh, they have not, they're not uh, acting upon the world in a way that uh, is conducive to their survival. What do I mean by that? Uh, everybody knows. So if you, not talking about it is a matter of speech, knowledge is a completely different thing. Uh, a, a, a patient and a family might go through their entire illness biography and never have said the word at all, uh, while at the same time having acknowledged that this was what was going on in the first place. So that's where it gets interesting for me. It's very easy for public health and uh, other kind of ethicists to dismiss the idea of non-disclosure as something uh, that forces a violence upon patients. And in certain cases, it does. In certain cases of gender, in certain cases of class, I'm not saying it doesn't. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that it's not, uh, that it, in doing so, we might sometimes uh, have a very condescending picture of what patients' uh, awarenesses are and uh, their own very complicated ways of uh, thinking about language and responding to the disease. So in a way, it's their diagnosis of their social world. Their desire to speak or not speak is their way of kind of diagnosing the world they live within. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to group two questions together. First, we have Deboshree Mukherjee. Uh, 
Hello? We can hear you. Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, Dwight, great to see you and congratulations on this book. Um, as a film scholar, I feel compelled to ask this question. Uh, so here goes. Um, it's really remarkable that you're marshalling a very impressive range of interpretive texts to seriously, I think, plumb some of the questions and concepts, uh, which are very ex vexing kind of experiential dilemmas um, about the unspeakable, the misrecognized, and the seemingly insurmountable. And you have a whole chapter, chapter number five, uh, which is titled Cancer Films in which you say that films about cancer extend my ethnographic work, not only because they offer new empirical cases, but because they offer contrasting conceptual frames that help develop my analysis of the face-to-face -face ethnographic work. So I'm just uh, ask, inviting you to walk us through a little bit about how you decided to think seriously with film and what conceptual frames uh, were, became available to you there. Thank you. And we're going to take a second question um, from Sarita. You are still muted. Hi. Hi, Dwight. Congratulations. I'm looking forward to reading the book. My question is short. Um, it is, I'd love to hear from you how the shift in optic you're tracing between kind of the traditional sites of researching cancer to the world of pain, um, the ethics of concealment, the relations we have that aren't, that are beyond empathy, how that works um, or how you situate an analysis of the body within that. And perhaps especially in terms of um, both the body in pain, there's a long literature on that, but also um, different body parts and how they relate, for instance, to the question of gender, embodiment, and so on. Thank you. Those are both such great questions, especially <laughs> so let me talk about parts of the book I really want to. Uh, so they are, for those who haven't read it, two chapters, one on cancer memoirs and one on cancer films. And uh, I I, it's not always very conventional to uh, juxtapose ethnography with uh, aesthetics in this way, but I found it really interesting to do so because uh, there were things happening there that were not happening in my ethnography. Very simply put, aesthetic accounts often tended to, and as they should in the structure of drama, resolve so much, so much, so many of the indeterminacies of actually living with the disease. So uh, I don't know, a lot, some of you uh, might be familiar with perhaps the most iconic cancer film in India, Anand, where this super cheerful patient uh, uh, actually teaches the doctor who is so depressed uh, how to be more cheerful about the diagnosis. And uh, this happens often, patients in these films die, but they die leaving a lesson for everyone else to uh, endure better and to actually learn moral lessons about uh, fortitude, et cetera. So what do I make of that? Uh, one, I like that the films deal with death. Doctors, in, in uh, many of the cancer uh, doctors I spoke to don't like the fact that Indian films deal with death because they find that to be a sort of slur on their profession and so forth. I like the fact that they actually take up uh, the idea that patients actually die rather than somehow always survive. But I don't like the moralizing uh, thing that often comes with these films, that somehow it makes you a better person. And this runs through with the memoirs, that you should learn a lesson about how to be better. And these were rampant in the cancer memoirs I talked about. It's all over the titles. The titles were, for example, uh, To Cancer My Love, uh, My Date with Cancer, uh, just, just these very uh, affective, and these are Hindi and English memoirs from Delhi. And uh, in a way, it's cruel optimism at its finest. It's a way to kind of come to uh, this relationship of intimacy with one, one's own disease that completely obscures how difficult it is to actually live with it. Uh, but to very quickly end that, uh, I'll say that this is not representative of all the films and uh, uh, memoirs I was talking about. I found some really compelling that were uh, that really did take the indeterminacy and the political economy of cancer as its central concern. And I sort of try and use that those as intertextual to my own analysis. 
coming to the question of pain is super interesting because uh, like you i think sarita uh, are uh, thinking of in many uh, obviously jump to immediately zelens carries analysis of pain as the the most kind of uh, private experience uh, experience that cannot be translated that forms this barrier between patient uh, uh, experiencer and witness uh what do you do with the fact that in delhi this is the profession of a uh, uh, huge bunch of people to actually relate to pain to actually put it into language or if not language into one's relation with another and so for me that uh, communicability of pain however difficult became a sort of ethical a, a, a side of ethics to think through um and the fact that it didn't have to be through language i'm not saying that it pain can be easily translated and then appreciated what the caregivers and doctors understood was that there was a barrier but that didn't mean a, uh, a an inability to apprehend the experience of the other uh, and why was that important that was important because uh, thinking of pain as something that could actually be communicated allowed them to create these uh, ideas of uh, pain as simultaneously biological social and economic so uh, some of the uh, caregivers uh, and uh, workers i was working with were the most sophisticated in thinking about an ethnography and anthropology of pain uh, because pain is that site which ties together the psychic the emotional uh, the political economic as well as the biological in a way that you can't just test and disease uh, and image your way out of it is something uh, it's a condition where you have to take seriously the experience of the person going through it uh, and so yeah uh, 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 contrast carry it's important for me to think of pain as an intensely social experience so i just want to mention that it's 6 o'clock and um everyone should go out and buy this book and kavita if you want to tell us a little bit more about the center we will keep with going with the q and a but i just wanted to make sure that we end the formal part of our conversation first to say thank you to dwai thank you to bonita and kavita please kavita you're muted <laughs> Thank you to everyone, but I'd quickly like to say that uh, we do have another event coming up, uh, which is about recasting fieldwork and archives uh, in the global history of science and medicine, uh, both during and after the pandemic. So we're going to have a range of scholars and students join us. Please keep your eyes peeled and join us for that. And um, thank you again, Dwai, for your book. And uh, let's continue the discussion, uh, Durba Upanita, and the audience. Thanks again. Congratulations, Dwai. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to mention there's still some questions, just as an FYI, Dwai, and I wanted to make sure there was space to answer that. Uh, Raja Shekhar, Rama Krishnan, I think. Yeah, thanks very much for uh, uh, for this great program. I, I haven't been to your program before, and it was very. Uh, uh very very nice and uh, so the i bring a slightly different uh, perspective perhaps because uh, i have a technical background and i work at a medical center at columbia so uh, with respect to pain being uh undervalued in the us i think you know a lot of things in the us obviously have to do with uh, professionalization you know who's uh, who's going to profit from uh, certain activities and also to what extent some things have been standardized normalized so pain management is not considered so interesting because it's not like there are problems to be solved you know it's much more of an on a, on an individual basis how do you deal with a with an individual specific pain and i think that that is you know that would be a reason and uh, not to you know uh downplay that uh the topic at all but i think that is something to be kept in mind mm -hmm. and with respect to concealment i think if you see old uh hollywood movies or english films you will see plenty of situations where a patient is not told of their diagnosis especially if it is cancer because uh, you know it is thought at that time cancer diagnosis was basically 
a sentence of death sentence. So you didn't want to tell the patient that they were going to die. And so I wonder to what extent some thought process like that might be there in India as well. And even the point of a patient themselves saying oncology instead of cancer, whether that itself is a way to uh, manage, negotiate the situation so that you don't feel hopeless when you're talking about, uh, thinking about yourself. But more substantially, uh, for me, I, I, and I know it may not at all be part of your book because I haven't uh, read your book yet, uh, your opening remarks introducing uh, talking about cancer as a Western lifestyle caused condition. I think, uh, I think it's useful to keep a couple of things in mind. You know, one is that smoking, obesity, and alcohol, you know, if, you th if one, one wants to think of as three major risk factors for cancer. Now, the problem is that once you move past those three, cancer is unpredictable. It's sporadic. So for instance, there is a lot of interest in the West about inherited, hereditary cancer. You know, people say, oh, family history, you know, you're a woman's uh, uh, mother's sister developed breast cancer, so she's at risk for breast cancer. That is true, she is at increased risk, but the actual breast cancer risk attributable to families is pretty small. Somewhere between five and 10% of all breast cancer cases are familiar. But there is a lot of talk about family history because that's one of the few things people can actually talk about. So for the most part, breast cancer, or say for me, prostate cancer, is a sporadic event. And so it's unpredictable. So what are you going to tell people? So the only thing you can tell people is smoking, obesity, alcohol, and maybe more frequent testing, screening, if you have family history. So, so in that sense, that's where the West is right now. Now, the problem I have with uh, Modi, you know, I could have many, many problems with Modi, but, but when you say that he talks about the same sorts of issues, that is because he doesn't actually want to do anything about what to me is a major cause of cancer in India, which is the environment. So, you know, you, you're in Delhi, there's horrible pollution. And, you know, so that getting rid of that itself will have a big effect on cancer risk. But the state doesn't want to do anything about it. So it just comes down to Individual, you you tran you transform the problem into something that an individual has to cope with, rather than society. So it's easy for the prime minister or anyone else to say, watch what you drink or watch what you eat or what what you smoke, because it absolves them of responsibility for dealing with environmentally caused cancer. And I think that that you know is useful to keep in mind. And, uh, I'm going to interrupt so, you because we have other questions, sir. Oh no, 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 that's fine. I think uh, I think I've said uh, everything I wanted to say. Lopean, you know, I have an old friend who I think is in the same uh, the department as you, Abha Sur, uh, if I remember right. Uh, you know, I haven't talked to her recently, so uh, uh, so I'll I'll be in touch with you through Abha, if nothing else. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, no, uh, I'm going to answer uh, two of the three uh, and try to do so briefly, but there's such important questions. Uh, uh, the first one about the undervaluation of pain in the United States and what the Indian case and my ethnography has to say about this. Um, I mean, we are, of course, talking about the opioid epidemic uh, nonstop. This is a concern that is really on everyone's mind. Uh, but what I found really curious going in as a naive non-medical person was that uh, anesthesiology, the perhaps most valued profession or uh, the most well-paid or, or, or most of the biomedical specializations was not dealing with cancer pain because it was thought of as something that is just uh, the work of counselors or nurses. They were interested in those really difficult cases where you can uh, intervene surgically and uh, things like that. But 
the people, anesthe- uh, yeah, that, that, it just struck me as odd. I, the idea of anesthesiologists not dealing with pain uh, and that being systematic in the US was uh, striking. Uh, so uh, when I, so one of the reasons I did the field work at all in Delhi was that when I went to Ames, I found exactly the opposite. I'm not saying this is any way representative of India, but in this specific hospital, the palliative care unit was started and run by anesthesiologists, unlike anywhere else I've seen anywhere. And these anesthesiologists, uh, and part of it has to do with this charismatic person who started this, uh, but the young residents who joined the department weren't always happy at all. I mean, they came in thinking they're going to be the big shots, they're going to be the top of the food chain, and here they were doing the very uh, uh, everyday work of actually listening to patients and hear them tell them stories of their lives. Uh, so this was a really interesting configuration for me that here was a place which is supposed to be so under-resourced, uh, so kind of uh, overrun by, uh, uh, and they are, they see 100 to 150 patients a day, yet the top echelon of biomedical specialists were taking cancer pain as the central thing that they were interested in, setting up a department for it, uh, allocating resources in a way that no institution in the U.S. Uh, is taking seriously. I mean, some are beginning to, but palliative care is uh, not where it should be here. Uh, so that was an interesting thing for me to track, the undervaluation there, and nothing uh, pain is well treated all across India at all, but this one specific case was really enlightening to me. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. The idea of Western lifestyles as contributing to cancer, smoking, obesity, and so forth is a very nice, I'm not saying they're false, but they're very nice ways to distract from the politics of the disease. Uh, and, uh, and that's part of the point of my book that uh, what what follows from that what follows from that in the guidelines is that what India really and this is actually a shift you can trace from the 70s and 80s a, mo- a very conscious government move from treatment to screening and what does that do I mean screening sounds great more screening more uh, less cancer but what screening also does is shift the responsibility again upon patients and say that oh why and this is completely pervasive. If you go to uh, oncologists, the first thing they'll tell you is, why didn't you come before? Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're poor or rich, this is always the accusation thrown at you. Uh, and so screening is a really nice way to get out of the infrastructural problem and say that it's up to the patients. They should have figured this out earlier on and then it'll be fine. Uh, so that's why I'm uh, slightly suspicious of this very uh, uh, planned and conscious move by the Indian government towards screening programs rather than towards building uh, infrastructural uh, capacities to treat the disease. I think that one of the things that uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan, Dr. Ramakrishnan pointed out, I like that word absolution. What do we do to create absolution for ourselves um, around cancer so that we can individuate it rather than make it a systemic thing? Um, Kavita, you have the last question. Thank you. Dwai, I wanted to kind of press you a little bit on this question about pain. Because I think uh, when we think about pain, we're thinking of it as a kind of theater and who professes pain and whose pain is important. So I was thinking if we thought, for instance, of pain as a kind of dependence, right? And uh, if you look at the pain, uh, cancer-related pain amongst the working classes based on uh, cancers relating to silicosis, to asbestosis, to a range of occupational health hazards, that kind of pain is recognized in very different ways and it gets obliterated for very, very different reasons from not seeing the pain or concealing pain as it is with the urban middle classes. So uh, when you talk about pain, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on, on, the, on the connections between cancer, pain and the, 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 wider, the wider kind of social shifts that are happening at this point of time in terms of labor, in terms of capitalism, uh, the all around Delhi, and when you can, you know, and, and that's the working class that doesn't really matter. So I was thinking if you could kind of relate it a little bit to that, when pain is dependence, when, and, and, it, uh, and pain is related to the kinds of people you don't want to hear or who are invisible, it's very different from the pain of Shambhu and his, uh, you know, and his wife and a range of the other narratives you've brought out. So I was wondering if you could make the connection with some of this, that some of the, some of the shifts that are happening at this point of time 
relating to labor, relating to risks and exposure. So I'm actually building on the last uh, question. I, I think that's an excellent question. And I think it's something I should have uh, 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 made further clear because uh, when I was first exposed to it, to this question of pain and uh, its relationship to labor, uh, it was for a different project. Uh, when I was working with the survivors of the Bhopal gas disaster, and what I noticed there was the uh, everyday use of uh, uh, what is called here uh, Tylenol, uh, crocine, acetam, uh, acetam, and a friend. Uh, this was, uh, this, it was taken almost for granted that uh, the, working, uh, the working class, uh, 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 the working class affected by the disaster had for the entirety of their lives to be able to continue to labor under conditions of duress, taking a painkiller that over, a, which is fine to take once every now and then, but if you take it as your daily uh, vitamin in this sense, it damages uh, your body organs in ways that are equally uh, disastrous. So that aspect of the classing of pain is super crucial for me uh, in a way that it, pushes me to not think of pain itself as something that is ontologically something that we can take for given. Uh, working class pain is not the same as the pain uh, experienced uh, in the way that the idea of pain is flattened in as soon as you abstract towards uh, its biological etiologies and its biological manifestations. So I, I just very quickly, the last thing I'll say about that is uh, that what the very good faith attempt of palliative care practitioners to do in India is to expand the idea of pain from uh, what it is by, uh, understood to be as biological to this idea of uh, quote unquote total pain, which uh, encompasses psychological, economic, uh, uh, so, uh, so, uh, social and biological etiologies. And this is such a great effort to kind of think of pain beyond its just biology. But I think there's one limit here, which is the socioeconomic. And so this is where, uh, when I was working with doctors at Ames, particularly, uh, we were working on a pain diagnostic instrument. And uh, people familiar with uh, this will know when you go in to get pain treated, you are asked a series of questions, then your pain is given a certain kind of score. Uh, and what they put me in charge of was a project to better understand the social part of the total pain and to create a better questionnaire that would address that. Um, and so I looked around for what was being done and uh, in almost every one of the pain questionnaires I found, there was no mention of class. Uh, the one place that class came up was guess, uh, guess where? Kerala. The only kind of uh, pain inventory that took uh, account of class was the Kerala Cancer, uh, I forget the exact acronym. Uh, and so my uh, intervention was here, here we go, <laughs> we need to just basically uh, use this as the model to understand uh, how pain is uh, a socioeconomic thing. So I think this is a big limitation that uh, we're in the middle of trying to figure out and there's a huge kind of debate between Kerala and Delhi, which I'm not going to go into here. Uh, but to take into account the socioeconomic etiologies and not just the familial and the uh, psychosocial, which we've begun to think about, is a desperate need in thinking about palliative care, even in the context that I work in. Thank you so much, Dwai. Congratulations on your book. Um, I, if, I don't think anyone else has any other questions, but we just are here to listen to you talk about this book. So um, thank you.